Over the last three or so years, I've made a lot of videos debunking various teachings and teachers themselves. And most of these were somehow related to the New Age movement, but there's been a few exceptions. And as a result, I've received a lot of requests from people to debunk certain cults or false teachers. And a typical request is something like, please take a look at this New Age guru or false teaching and debunk it for me because my son or daughter or husband or friend or somebody has fallen for it and they're totally lost. So this presentation is for you. It's to hopefully show you and others why and how to effectively refute false teachers and false teaching. Looking back on it, of all the refutations that I've done, they were all kind of laid on my heart to do in a way. I had a desire to see people delivered from some specific deception or another. Maybe it was because I was once deceived by that particular teacher or teaching, or maybe I knew someone that was deceived by it personally. If you are worried about a friend or family member being deceived by a false teaching, then you have the one thing that is needed to effectively do it, a desire, a motivation to do it. The rest of the stuff is able to be learned, and that's what we're going to do today. Debunking is Biblical the book of Titus has a lot of information for us regarding refutations. In Titus 1, verses 10 and 11, it says, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. Paul here tells his protege Titus that these deceivers' mouths must be stopped. He says that their teachings are subverting entire households. The Greek word here translated subvert is only used one other time in the New Testament, and it's also by Paul in 2 Timothy 2, verse 18, where it's translated, overthrow. It says, Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So the other instance of this word is also talking about a specific false teaching, in this case by Hymenaeus and Philetus, that overthrows faith. And that is why this kind of thing must be stopped, Paul says. So let's take a look at some other examples. Another passage in Titus says, Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. So we have another imperative here from Paul. Rebuke them sharply in regard to their believing fables and the commandments of men. Please notice the reason why this is to be done, and this will keep coming up again and again, that they may be sound in the faith. This is not to win an argument. It's not to prove that you're right and that other people are wrong. A biblical debunking must be motivated by love for the people that you're trying to help. That word rebuke is elegho in the Greek, and it's basically the word for debunk. In the verses that we're going to be looking at, the meanings are to convict, refute, confute, by conviction, to bring to light, to expose, to find fault with, to correct, to reprehend severely, chide, admonish, reprove, to call to account, to show one his fault, demand an explanation. Also in Ephesians 5, verse 11, it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And that word expose is the same Greek word, elegho, that we just looked at. So again, we have a clear biblical mandate. But also take note that at present, I'm talking mostly about teaching that is overthrowing people's faith in Jesus Christ and the necessity and sufficiency of his propitiation for salvation. I have not necessarily been talking about refuting your fellow Christian about non-salvific doctrinal issues. That is, I believe, another matter altogether, and we're going to get to that in another section. Paul's letter to the Galatians was basically an exquisite debunking of the so-called Judaizers. These are people that Paul says in Galatians 6.12 that for the sake of avoiding persecutions from the Jews, and other reasons, began to teach people that they needed to go back under the Jewish law to an extent in order to be saved, primarily the law regarding circumcision. Paul considers this teaching a direct assault on the gospel itself. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Paul then begins six chapters of methodical tearing down of this false teaching. He starts by defending his apostleship, which apparently the false teachers were questioning, and then he begins to passionately pour out an intense Bible study, showing from the Old Testament that even their fathers were saved by grace through faith and not of works. He appeals to the experience of the Galatians, the example of Abraham, the faith of Abraham, the permanence of the promise, the purpose of the law, its temporary nature, and its inferior status. And then he starts his argument represented by this outline about liberty and the law. 
using scriptures and examples from modern life, even sports analogies. And all this was apparently necessary because some guys who probably had silver tongues came in and started teaching people, giving these presentations and Bible studies and deceiving people. The Colossians were similarly bewitched, if you will. And while scholars debate about the exact nature of the deception, we can infer quite a lot about it. I'm actually under the impression that it was just one very charismatic person that had convinced the Colossian church of various deceptions, not a number of teachers like was probable in Galatia. So what were they teaching? First, a reduction of Christ. Second, an imposition of Jewish rules and rituals. Third, aestheticism. These are extra rules for holiness, like diet and other things. Fourth, angel worship. We see in Colossians 2, verse 18, the worship of angels being mentioned. Fifth, a dependent on this man's own special revelations and teachings. So Paul's letter to them is a refutation of all these things. And it's interesting, too, how Paul attacks things like the diminishing of Christ, for example. He comes out guns blazing in chapter 1 with one of the highest exaltations of Christ as God in the New Testament. He says in Colossians 1, verse 14, "...in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible." Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He fights bad doctrine with good doctrine. That's the principle here. One commentator said, The book of Colossians will specifically show how the apostle goes up against one big name, one heretical proto-televangelist who perhaps could fill the auditoriums of his day and rivet crowds with his personal teachings and experiences and revelations. What will Paul do? Find dirt on the man's private life? Focus on the way he dresses or lives? Or how much money he gets or spends? Or what rumors are told of him? How will the apostle respond to this one charismatic false teacher? And of course, this commentator goes on to explain that Paul refutes these arguments with better argumentation and by showing the fallacy of the false teachings themselves. And we could talk about the Thessalonian letters, which were apparently written to combat false teachers who had told those in Thessalonica that they had missed the rapture and were in the day of the Lord. And they had apparently even forged a letter as if it was from an apostle to bolster their case. Or we could talk about Second Peter, which is entirely about false teachers. Or we could talk about the letters from John, which seems to be combating an early form of Gnosticism. But I think you get the point here, that debunking is biblical. So what are some reasons why it should be done? Number one, in my opinion, is that debunking is a very effective means of evangelism. Now, when you consider that most false doctrine and cults' main point is to keep people from salvation in Christ, oftentimes by eliminating the deception, and obviously with the Holy Spirit's help, they are led to Christ. I look at it as kind of sweeping away the things that have intellectually kept them from considering the gospel. A relevant verse to this is found in Paul's second letter to Timothy, where it says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Another reason to do it is that people are in bondage to false teaching of all types. Galatians 2 verse 4 says, And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage. So the love that we have for a family member or a friend or a co-worker that is in bondage, that's a reason to do it. False teaching geared towards Christians is like this. It's usually a hyper-legalism thing. But in the New Age, that bondage can take the form of bondage to demons, who essentially are tricking people to giving demons authority over them, which can lead to demonic oppression and even possession. And so it's a ministry of compassion, trying to show people that they are in danger to bondage. And of course, offering a solution, which is Jesus. Number three is that it's really needed. There's not a lot of people doing it. The New Age and occultism has 
exploded pretty much in our times. It's everywhere. It's accepted. It's on TV. It's in the music. It's the cool thing to do. And these things are based on really just cleverly devised lies that are enticing people to open up doors in their life, which, as many of you know, is really dangerous. In regards to spiritual battle with dark forces, Paul uses the word that the King James translates wrestle, and it's used like a soldier in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And so we ought to battle it out with this deception, or at least those things that the Lord lays in our heart to battle. We can't fight every battle, but we can wrestle with the ones that are attempting to infiltrate our circle of friends or family in some way. Often a new believer will be attacked with some false doctrine, and you should be ready to help them see that this new false doctrine is in fact false, not just tell them that it's false. God puts certain things in your path, and sometimes he doesn't want you to simply walk around it. Our enemy is pretty fierce. 1 Peter 5 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is a really good liar. I like the way that the NIV translates John 8:44. It says, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. He knows all about lies. He is fluent in lies. Once you begin to embark on deconstructing whatever system of lies it is, when you really look under the hood, so to speak, you're going to be struck with the craftiness of it all. He not only knows how to lie, but he's also a really good human psychologist. He always appeals to our pride. We all want to be special, elite, know something that the rest of the people don't know, and he uses that to his advantage. And it's nothing new. This is also something he used in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3, it says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You'd be surprised how many times he uses this particular lie, in fact. Uh, maybe it has nostalgic value to him or something. And as you can see, this is a very scientific graph that I made. Uh, the truth is often uh, used as bait. The more juicy the truth, the better. Many times the truth is something that is not commonly known by most people, but yet it can be validated with a minimal amount of research. Something like Easter is a pagan holiday and it comes from you know, Ishtar. Something like that would be a good bit of truth that you could offer somebody and you could go look it up and say, oh my gosh, it is true. And this gains the subject's trust in the teacher or the system. Uh, no one else taught them that and pretty soon they won't be checking facts anymore. This is especially true when whatever they are being told, they want to believe. That's the problem with a lot of spiritual deception. People would prefer the religion that they're being sold. It's the religion man would make up for himself in most cases. They get to be God. There's no accountability for their action. Truth is relative. A man would fight to defend such a view. Often, when you're engaging with people, you need to know what is true about their beliefs because there is no cult that does not have some element of truth. And let them know that you agree with them about that if it comes up. Okay, so what about debunking other Christians? Now, the Lord has a lot to say about how to deal with a fellow Christian that is sinning in some way. For instance, Matthew 18, 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, after reviewing this, I'm not sure that this verse applies directly to our situation here because this is more about personal sin and it's not really about false teaching. But I do think that 2 Timothy 2 speaks volumes on this issue, so I'm going to quote extensively from it now. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. And nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, 
but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So I don't recommend starting any kind of, quote, ministry debunking ministers, especially publicly that you don't agree with on various doctrinal issues, because first of all, it could be you that's wrong on that issue. Secondly, in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, which he wrote from Rome, where he was under house arrest for two years, where he was seeing all kinds of people preaching Christ incorrectly, he had this to say, and I'm quoting from the International Standard for clarity's sake. Philippians 1, verse 15. Some are preaching the Messiah because of jealousy and dissension, while others do so because of their good will. The latter are motivated by love, because they know that I have been appointed to defend the gospel. The former proclaim the Messiah because they are selfishly ambitious and insincere, thinking that they will stir up trouble for me during my imprisonment. But so what? Just this, that in every way, whether by false or true motives, the Messiah is being proclaimed. Because of this, I rejoice and will continue to rejoice. So, some of these people preaching Christ are described by Paul as, quote, selfishly ambitious, jealous, dissenters, and desiring to stir up trouble for him. And Paul says, hey, let him preach. That's fine with me now, and I will continue to be fine with that. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that these people were necessarily preaching heresy. But realize when Paul and the other apostles did step in to start doing a little debunking, it was on issues like Jesus not really being God in the flesh, like the Apostle John talks about extensively in his letters, or things like worshiping angels, or that salvation was by some other means than grace through faith in Jesus. Now, Paul does not even give those teachers the benefit of the doubt. He never even seems to appeal to the Judaizers or to the Colossian heretic themselves. He simply goes over their heads and appeals to the people that have been deceived by them. So, if that's why you're refuting a person, even though they claim to be a Christian, that is something like they claim that Jesus wasn't God, or that there's another way to salvation, or that you should channel angels, or something like that, you have a clear biblical green light. It doesn't matter if they're professing to be a believer or not. So, as far as doctrinal issues among believers, I would say, leave it alone. This war has way better targets than that. Don't set out to be a heresy hunter to major on the minors. You're going to find that more times than not, you're going to be doing more damage than good. So I think we have here on this last slide our guiding principle for this type of refutation. What are your motives? They must be, will God give them repentance uh, to acknowledge the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil? who has been taken captive by his will. What's your attitude? You know, that's that's the question. Don't strive, as it says here, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Now, if you truly have this attitude when you're privately rebuking a brother for going astray doctrinally, you will need this verse from Titus 3, which says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a device of man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. So I'm convinced this is really for the good of the person doing the debunking. Again, this is usually in a private context. If you've if you've tried to appeal to a friend once and twice about this error that they're in, and you've tried to, to show them that it's error from the scriptures, then, and that they still won't listen to you, this is for your good to be able to say, okay, well, I've done what I can, I'm going to commit them to the Lord and move on. Okay, now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of how to do this. The first thing that you need to do is to understand what is being taught. This is absolutely vital. I can't overemphasize this. If you don't understand what's being taught, you can't teach others why it's wrong. So take your time with this one. Watch videos, read books, read articles on the internet or anywhere else. I'll usually find anything that I can in video form and seek to really understand what they're saying. If you can find the person's books or the teachings books in PDF format, it's going to be invaluable to you later on because you can do searches for certain terms to see what they've said on a particular point. That way you won't have to read every square inch of their material. 
look to see if there's any previous refutations on the internet. Oftentimes the reason that we would be doing a refutation is because there are no previous refutations, or the ones that exist are simply personal attacks or useless in some other way. But perhaps there are good refutations of the concept out there, but they need to be collected and made coherent. There have been many cases in the refutations I've done where the information was already out there, but not in a nice, neat, easy to understand package. So do a Google search with your terms, plus words like refuted, debunked, wrong, or problems, and go through them and get ideas. Find testimonies of people that have come out of that particular deception and seek to understand their mindset. What causes them to fall for it? Now whether you can find testimonies like this or not, you should begin to develop a heart for those people that have been deceived. Again, take your time. You can't force truly understanding something, so don't even try. Just soak it in. Also take notes. My note taking process has become really helpful, so it's worth spending a little extra time on that subject a little later on. Okay, research tips. I was going to say that you need a strong faith and really know your Bible in order to go through these types of false teachings, but I would modify that and say that you just need to be a good researcher and not particularly gullible to false teaching. In my life, I actually developed my faith in the Bible being absolutely true as a result of answering critics' bold claims against it. One of my favorite quotes is from Charles Spurgeon who said, The word of God is like a lion. You don't need to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose, and the lion will defend itself. Another one is from Chuck Missler who says, Thus we discover that every detail of the Bible is there by design. This insight opens an entirely new dimension of Bible study. Every time you find a mistake or contradiction in the Bible, rejoice. There is a discovery behind that ostensible discrepancy. These two quotes have become really personal to me as they've become very real in my life and in my ministry. Now I recommend finding this out for yourself, though, not taking my word for it. When you're listening to some smooth talker tell you about how the Bible is wrong because of so-and-so and that Jesus wasn't really who he said he was because of such and such reason, and it looks like he has a point on the surface then you need to not be afraid of looking into it with diligence. And I can tell you from experience that the deceivers rely on you not knowing more than them on a particular subject. As a result of this experience and having validated the Bible's truth to such a degree through my research, I've been able to cut a lot of corners when looking for weak points in the arguments of false teachers. That is, whenever they say something that contradicts the Bible or undermines Jesus, which is the goal of most false teachings, then I make a note of it for further research later. I used to think, well, that claim sounds a little squirrely. I'll look that up a little later and see what I can find out about it. But now it's evolved to, that claim contradicts the Bible. I'll look that up a little later and see what I can find out about it. I find that this method also helps to get to the heart of the matter, and it makes sure that you're not dwelling on unimportant, unfruitful issues, even if they are easily debunked. In short, if it contradicts the Bible, it's wrong. It's up to you to find out why. Again, I don't expect anyone to start out seeing the world through the lens of the Bible. But when and if you get there, it will make your job of finding holes in arguments much more efficient. Which brings me to another point. What not to debunk? I think that it was Walter Martin who said, don't use personal attacks on the leader of a cult. For example, showing their bank accounts or their bad business deals or their marital unfaithfulness, etc. It's totally useless in my opinion. It will start an argument, but I've never seen it win a soul. And it's also unnecessary when the truth is on your side. So play fair, be blameless. Don't dwell on useless errors. In other words, no nitpicking. Let your arguments strike to the very core of the theology of the false teaching. Your goal is to sweep away the theological strongholds that are keeping people from faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's one that I had a hard time with early on. Don't get mad. Before I wrote scripts, I would simply start recording myself ranting at the easily debunked blasphemy of people. I couldn't believe the nerve they had, and it showed. But, as the saying goes, you catch more flies with honey... Than with vinegar. So really be neutral. Try to deal with the errors in a clinical, methodical way. Try to leave emotion at the door. The people that you're trying to reach will appreciate it. So when you start to investigate a claim, be confident. Know that the truth is on your side if what you're looking up contradicts the Bible, and begin to find the very best available information on the subject in question. Please note that the more dangerous the truth is, 
the more slick, seemingly very intellectual articles you will find that oppose the idea and make it sound very plausible. You must already anticipate there being this kind of opposition out there, so you're not swayed when you encounter it. But don't give in at the first sign of opposition. Too often people Google something and find an article opposing it. They get discouraged and they call it a day. That can't be you. So continue to look for unbiased information. Know that your goal is to find the very best available information. This may require its own set-apart time of understanding, like we talked about in the first step, but that was more about understanding the big picture. But here, this is on a specific claim used to build the thesis. If a claim is, say, about magnetic pole shifts, and you're trying to refute some idea about it, you will have to understand as much about magnetic pole shifts as possible with the best non-biased information about magnetic pole shifts. Nine times out of ten, simply understanding a concept will reveal the deception. Let me say that again. Nine times out of ten, simply understanding a concept will reveal the deception. One example was in the case of refuting Greg Braden's claim about the so-called Schumann resonance, which he was ultimately using to get people to believe that there was a coming evolution of humanity to godlike beings, etc. And it was as simple as understanding the very basics of what the Schumann resonance was, which made it crystal clear that his theory about what it was was nonsense, and it was easy to demonstrate to others as well after that. I want to put this in here too. If you're recently out of the occult, or if you've had an addiction to this type of research, you probably don't need to be looking into the occult or New Age stuff, even to refute it. Number one, it can be dangerous for you, because it's like opening up those doors again. In addition, it can be very seductive to you. So know your limitations. There are many other things that need to be refuted besides New Age or occult stuff, so maybe you should look into some of those things instead. Perhaps something where you have to study the Bible a lot. Okay, on note-taking, I used to just not do anything at all during the understanding process. My only goal was to understand. I have since become much more effective by taking notes as I progress. The broad picture is that I want to watch and learn until I hear something that's not right. It may be obviously a lie, maybe something I've dealt with before, maybe it contradicts the Bible, whatever, but when I hear it or see it, I'm going to make a note of it. This is especially important to do if you're planning on making a video later on because you'll want to make a note of what video and what time signature in the video a certain thing was said or done. And this will save you a huge amount of time later on. Same thing if you read something in a book or a website. Make a note of what book and what page or what was the website URL and always give some quick idea of what was said. Not only is this for easy reference later on, but it will also help with your bibliography. Because the nature of this type of thing is that you're going to be dealing with people that are skeptical naturally, and that's a good thing. So you need to be able to refer them to where you're getting your information. Another thing that I find really helpful is to color code notes by topic. So I might be taking notes in Microsoft Word, and I might make the whole paragraph that I just copied from some website about a particular issue blue and anything else I find about that particular issue I'm going to make blue too. If I find a quote in a video on YouTube about that issue I'm going to make it blue. The benefit of that is that when you have many pages of notes and you're ready to make an outline it's good to know where to look. And I'm sure you guys could probably find an even better way to organize your notes by topic but either way I think organization is important. Now I really never paid that much attention in English class in school and so I had to learn through trial and error in my adult life that outlines are very, very important and make putting together a script or an article with a lot of research a whole lot easier and ultimately more effective, which is our goal. At this point, I usually print out my color-coded notes and then I get a regular pad of paper and go somewhere and just think about it. At this point, I've usually been at the computer a long time during all the other processes and I think the outline is where the art is, if you will. And as a result, I'll usually go somewhere to be inspired and to think about it. The big picture here is that you want to lay out your argument in a logical way, building your case and keeping in mind your audience. This can sometimes be the most difficult process, especially if you have a ton of information to present. But the good news is, once the outline is done, it's pretty much all downhill from there. Basically, you're making an article after this. 
And this article in my case is usually just called a script since I hardly ever release them as blog posts and instead just record them and turn them into movies. If you have an article, it can become a lot of things. Your article can become a podcast or a movie or a forum post, a mass email, etc. But it all starts here. This is the irreducible part, the article. This process should be pretty easy if you have a well done outline. You may want to go through it after you're done with the article and make cuts. The simpler, the better. If you can get the process done in a 15 minute YouTube video, I guarantee it's going to be more effective. Because not only is the world getting almost exclusively audio visual in how it learns, but it's also getting rather impatient. So you may only have them for a short time and it's better not to waste any of it. If you plan on turning your article into a podcast or a video, you're going to need to record yourself reading it. So you're going to need a decent microphone or a headset and you can get one at Walmart for like 30 bucks. Logitech makes a good one, a USB headset. This to me is the most frustrating part, partly because over the years my standards have increased a little bit and I now try to record with minimal stumblings or imperfections, which means that I usually record them in small bits at a time continually erasing that segment until it's right and then moving on to the next bit. Now that causes all kinds of noise between the takes, but I clean that up later on. Strive to have a mild tone. Strive to be loving towards those that you're appealing to. There should be no condensation in your voice. This again is something I struggled with a lot early on. I use Total Recorder that you see on the left because it's really simple and easy to use. It does cost like $30 and I'm sure there are free programs that do just as good to record audio. Then I clean up that audio later on with a free program called Audacity, which you see on the right, which is good for fine tuning. That is cutting out noises between the small sections so it seems seamless. I don't record the whole thing with Audacity because it's a really bulky program and it creates a new track every time you stop recording. It's also prone to crashing and losing all the information if you don't save it. But there really is no better free program out there for doing all kinds of fine tuning work with audio. It's kind of like a free version of Pro Tools. You may have some video clips that you want to critique, perhaps a certain claim that someone is making on YouTube, and you want to use it as part of your debunking. It's very easy to download YouTube video clips to your hard drive using sites like keepvid.com or clipnabber.com. I have keepvid pictured here, and you simply copy the web address or the URL from the video that you want to download and paste it in the bar on the front page of their website and it will spit out download links in different formats. Depending on what site you're downloading from, the formats will vary. YouTube will most always give you the choice between FLV files and MP4 files, so just click on the one that you want and download it. Depending on what kind of video editing program you have, you're probably going to have to convert video files to another format. For instance, I have to convert a lot of video files to WMV files so that I can edit them. But you'll have all kinds of uses for a good converting tool. And I've used many free programs over the years, but this one is by far the best in my opinion, and it's called Any Video Converter, and it's a free program. Simply drag and drop your video files into this main section, choose what format you want to convert it to from this drop-down menu, and then simply hit Convert. As with all the software I will be mentioning, the best way, in my opinion, to learn about the specifics of how it works or how to do something, whether it's simple beginner stuff or very complicated, watch tutorials on YouTube. That's especially helpful for our next one. Okay, with video editing, don't be intimidated by it. As we're going to see, it's really easy. I knew nothing about it when I made my first video, and I found it was a really simple process. I've used many different editing programs over the years, and I've done free trials of many others, and I highly recommend Sony Vegas. It's really simple to use, it's very lightweight, so you can do other things on your computer at the same time, and it's really cheap. For a long time I used the $44 version and that was really all I needed and I eventually upgraded to Platinum 10 which is like $90 more because it has more video tracks. Sony Vegas also has like a $600 version as well. But you can do free trials of any of these versions with full capacity and you can see if it's something that you would like. There's also a free video editor on most PCs now called Windows Movie Maker and it's a really great program and you can learn about how to use it from online tutorials as well like from YouTube. Now this is what most video editing programs look like more or less. They're going to have a timeline here at the bottom and this is where you would add pictures or video clips. You can stretch the pictures or you can make cuts to the video clips to make 
them fit the length of time that they need to be on the screen or to match with the audio. And you can add the MP3s of your reading the script as well as music or sound effects on a different track. Again, watch tutorials on YouTube for specific questions you may have here. Now that you have your article or podcast or movie, technically you could have all three with only one research project, how do you get it to those that need it? Here's the principle. Go where the fish are and fish there. When I started this, I really only had one move, and that was discussion forums. So I would do an interview with, like, Joe Jordan, let's say, about the so-called alien abduction phenomena and how it was really demonic in its nature, and that the experiences could be stopped using the name and authority of Jesus, and go into the largest discussion forums on that topic and posting a link and a description of the podcast that I did. And I would give it a little title like, aliens or demons or something like that. And you can imagine that such a bold claim really creates a lively debate among UFO lovers. Oftentimes they really never needed to participate much after the initial posting as people kept fighting amongst themselves. In this context, controversy is your friend in discussion forums. Even negative posts that are full of hate have their purposes. I've heard many people say that it was the illogical, radical response of everyone else in the forum that really made them consider the information that was being presented in the post. Additionally, very big discussion forums like Above Top Secret and others are incredibly high-ranking websites. So in that sense, this is a lot like publishing your article or video. Because of the rank and because of the lively debate, Google ranks the posts by the name that you titled your thread. So, for instance, in this example, I could type in, you know, Zeitgeist Movie Debunked, and my forum post would probably rank very high, if not number one. So I would be a member of several forums, and whenever I would produce something, I would go to the forums that would be interested in that topic and post the topic there, which was always sure to create some fireworks. The thing is, is that there is a forum dedicated specifically to every false belief out there. You can pinpoint those you're trying to help and target them. This is a good way to go directly where the fish are. I once did a video for people that were suffering from sleep paralysis, and the forums about sleep paralysis wouldn't even let me post anything that tried to offer Jesus as a solution. They had actually come up with a rule in the forum that anybody, anybody saying that it was spiritual in nature couldn't post. So forums are going to be one of your best tools, so get acquainted with the popular ones. Video distributing sites, specifically YouTube. YouTube is its own universe. You know that Google is the most used search engine, but did you know that YouTube is number two when you look at the total number of search queries? It surpassed Yahoo in 2008, and it's up 31% since then. YouTube is a search engine, a discussion forum, and sadly, many people's today only source of spiritual education. But for many reasons, if your video has good content about the situation and has an appropriate title, it will be found. I would say that almost half of the emails that I get are from YouTube. So there's lots of opportunities and questions generated from YouTube videos. YouTube videos are also ranking in natural Google searches now, and they will one day perfect the technology that searches through the audio content in the videos, and it's going to be even more effective when that becomes available. Blogs and websites. If you don't have a blog, start one. It's too easy not to do, even if you're only going to use it once a year to archive some article that you wrote. You can get a free blog at WordPress or Blogger, both excellent platforms. So that would help your information to get ranked in Google. And in that case, they would be hosting your blog. The domain name would be like yourblog.wordpress.com. But if you want your own website, it's easier than ever before. A place like godaddy.com, you can get hosting for like $7 a month. And you can buy a domain name for like $11 a year or something like that. And literally, with a click of a button, you can install WordPress or some other easy-to-work-with platform, or they will pre-install it for you now. Uh, podcast. iTunes is so popular. You have someone's undivided attention with podcasts. Many people only listen to podcasts, maybe at work or something else. And if you're like me, I've called myself an MP3 junkie, so I just listen to audio constantly. But the same principle applies here. If you'll put your information out there on iTunes and title it well and give it appropriate tags, it will be found by precisely the people that need desperately to hear it. Also, DVDs and CDs. Perhaps you've made a video refuting Mormonism, and you would like to make DVDs to put them on cars at the local Mormon temple. Call me a conspiracy theorist if you like, but I look at our freedoms on the Internet right now as a luxury, 
And if we ever lose that kind of thing, handing out DVDs and CDs to people is what we must be prepared to do. And I explain how to do this easily, how to burn DVDs and CDs on my website, dvdtrack.com, and also on the front page of my YouTube video. Prayer. The most important factor not only making sure that your project gets to those that need it, which is incredibly important, but also it's needed to make the project worth watching. I also pray all through the process that the Lord would see it fit to go with the video to whoever's watching it, to convict them and to lead them to understanding and to repentance. For this reason, it's also good to share the gospel in some way, or at least to glorify the Lord in the presentation in some way. Oswald Chambers once said, Prayer does not fit us for the greater work, Prayer is the greater work. Dealing with opposition. Whenever you challenge a belief system that has allowed a person to disregard the Lord, and if true, it means that they're accountable for their sins, you're going to receive opposition. And it can be pretty hateful. But here are some things that I've learned. Number one, don't bite. And by that I mean that Satan often wants to drag us into his turf. He wants us to get angry. These people will say things that are clearly not true, and the goal seems to me to be to just to get you to start fighting and waste time. But don't take the bait. There's some people who have done videos about me out there that I want so bad to respond to, but I know it would only encourage them, so I just let my original information speak for itself. If someone sends you an angry email, respond to the points raised if you must, but do it in love. Don't bite. Don't respond to them in kind, no matter how tempting it may be. I've often noticed that people are often so surprised that you didn't respond to them in anger, like they're probably used to most people in their life doing, that they'll often immediately apologize. Pick your battles. I don't even read YouTube comments anymore. Messages, yes, but comments, no. There's something about that site that just brings out the worst in people. I found it's a total waste of time for me to get involved with the silly disputes that you often find in the comments section of YouTube videos, and the same thing goes for discussion forums. Answer valid objections. Yes, do that diligently, but not every objection is a valid one. If someone is genuinely seeking the truth, stay with them, work with them. They are the reason that you're doing what you're doing, so send them an email or a private message. Offer them the opportunity to ask you questions about anything. It doesn't matter if you don't know the answer. You can look it up if you don't. The only reason that I know the things that I do in regard to apologetics or whatever is because I learned it on a need-to-know basis in the context of dealing with people. Jesus is what this is all about. Every false idea or false teaching out there has some angle. It may not be immediately obvious, but the reason that it exists is to somehow marginalize him. So, for that reason, I would suggest to keep him involved in all of your projects. What the people you are talking to need, ultimately, is him. Thanks for your time.